Hello, Victor. Hello, Victor. Two is on mute. Victor. Hello, Arshad. I'll let you in. Okay. Hello, Victor. Mm. Hola, eh, yo no puedo conectar el audio. Okay, hola, hola, Harshad. Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for bringing all us. Well, it's good to see you appreciate it because you come to all of them. <laughs> yes, I yes, all of us. I'm following you rather than you following us. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, let me say hi to Victor. Hola, Victor. Yeah, Victor. Hi, hola, Victor. Victor. Victor, sí, ¿me escuchas? Sí. Está en trabajo, Victor, ¿eh? Sí, sí. Oh, sí, hablamos más tarde porque no es privado ahora, pero uh, sí, yo tengo un buen uh, desayuno con Victor uh, y mi, y mi uh, nieto, nieta, y, y él, quiere, él creo que tiene interés en haciendo cosas. Uh, ah, sí. espero, espero que sí. Sí. Aparte, aparte de todo esto, el resto, hay, hay buen cosas pasando con Neuroanatomy, Neuroanatomy TV también. Sí, 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 sí. Ok. Entonces, Entonces ok. Hablamos más tarde, ok, Victor? Sí, claro que sí. Gracias. Ok, yo voy a preparar para el chat, sí. ok? Sí, sí. Hi, Victor. Uh, Hello, how are you? I am good, Dr. Harshad Parekh from Bombay. Oh, yes. Dr. Harshad Parekh from Bombay. Now, Bombay, that's different than New Delhi, right? Mumbai, or Mumbai. Oh, Mumbai, not, not, I thought you said Bombay. Bo Mumbai, Mumbai, it is called Mumbai now, India. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, how are you? Nice Hello. to see I'm you. Good. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Everything fine. Good, good, really good. Good. Uh, good. I, I I have seen you in some uh, uh, webinars. Yeah, I am attending most of the webinars. Yes. John keeps us busy. Yes. He, he is doing a great job by bringing everybody on the one podium. Ah, uh, yes, see, yes, of course. Yes. We are, how, how we are is, learning a lot. How, how is COVID disease over there in Bombay? COVID, COVID is worsening. The, the number of cases are increasing. Yes. Death rate is less, but overall cases are 
quite a few. Wow, it's it's, it's crazy. bad. Yeah, yeah, it's very bad, very bad. Yeah. Just take care. Just take, take care. care. You too. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. you. See you. See you. Thank you.
Greetings, everybody. Greetings, everybody. The king has arrived. Everyone stand. The horns are raised. Greetings, Dr. Sabaya. Hello, good evening. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Fine. Uh, yeah, I got the questions all, all set up. I think they're going to, the, I appreciate giving them nice and short. No, yeah, exactly. You, you just want people to understand what's the gist of the, of the meeting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you're comfortable with that and you'll, you'll 
You'll change it yeah. to uh, whatever yeah. happens, whatever yeah. you think helps. Absolutely. But I, I, I like the platform. I, I think you'll get to know it. And I think we're going to get better at it uh, yeah. to make it part of a presentation. Sure, and, absolutely. And, yeah, and you may get other ideas how to use the play if you want. You know, I'll be glad to post them. But if you ever want to learn it, yeah, that's right. It's easy to learn. Okay, we start in eight minutes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure? Let me just do some last minute stuff. Absolutely. <clears throat> John, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, I've asked uh, the pathologist to join us for this meeting. Uh, so at a certain stage, I may ask them to interfere during the lecture. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Sure. Good. Uh, at the end, or is he going to come inside? The... Inside and at the end, both. Okay. I will, I will announce it. I will say, can I have the opinion of so and so? So yeah, sure. You just know. Oh, that's great. That's a great way to use this platform. Yeah. 
But you liked it from the very beginning, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, of course. It takes a while for some people to catch on, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but it, you caught on. You know, you caught on quick. Yeah, but if you do this year after year after year, it just becomes a habit. Yeah. Well, I know uh, as I get older, I'm going to enjoy using it. <laughs> you know, and uh, for uh, till the day I croak, I'm going to use it. No, you're not okay. You're not okay, Jim. Yeah, I'm okay, but I, I, you know, I, I've got something to do. <laughs> no. Sure. So uh, yeah, three minutes. So I'm we got a lot of we got a lot of last minute arrivals. Yeah, sure. Okay, one minute. Sure. Someone saying hello from Aberdeen, Scotland. Pragnesh, welcome. Welcome, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Aberdeen. <laughs> Great memories there. Okay, we're getting ready to start. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon from Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting for Neurosurgical TV. I got the wrong background. <laughs> I got to change it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we have, I'm pleasure, we're pleasured with the honor of having Dr. Ibrahim Sabaya, well-known uh, Jordanian neurosurgery educator. He's going to give a presentation today on primary intracerebral lymphoma, personal neurosurgical series. And welcome, Dr. Sabaya. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, again, I say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Sabaya, and we are transmitting... Uh, from Amman, from the Farah Medical Campus in Amman, Jordan. Uh, so this evening, um, we are going to discuss uh, a topic which is, for me, is the forgotten disease in neurology and neurosurgery and in general, that is lymphoma. And as a neurosurgeon, I'm going to talk about the primary lymphomas of the central nervous system. Uh, this is the black iris, the simple of Jordan. And uh, I'm going to discuss the primary sinus lymphoma 
and give you a brief uh, look into the personal microsurgical series that I had. We will take it from the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological correlation. So central nervous system lymphoma in general, um, you can see this specimen shows this region here. Uh, central nervous system lymphoma could be a B cell, could be T cell lymphoma, could be a large anaplastic cell lymphoma, or Burkitt's lymphoma. And uh, these lymphomas are either Hodgkin or non-Hodgkin. They can affect the immunocompetent and the immunodeficient. Of course, in the past, immunodeficient was much more, and there was surge of cases in the 80s and 90s with the introduction of AIDS, immunodeficiency, uh, whether this is uh, acquired or congenital, whether it is immunosuppression is just the same. If you are immunodeficient, then you would uh, get the disease the lymphoma in general. And lymphoma is the commonest tumor in the AIDS patients. So all the studies, you could see the primary CNS lymphoma in the immunodeficient, but with the treatment that has been given to the AIDS patients, the new studies are showing there's increasing numbers of immunocompetent. In fact, two or three new series which I looked at shows that the immunocompetent patients are now more affected than the immunodeficient. So this is a picture of a primary central nervous system lymphoma developing de novo, i.e. not in a, a patient with, a, with the, uh, AIDS or immunosuppression. And this is AIDS patient developing these lesions. And uh, this patient developing lymphoma as a post-transplant where people are put under uh, immunosuppression. Uh, if we look at the CNS involvement, it's either a primary CNS lymphoma, and that's why we call it PCNS lymphoma, primary CNS lymphoma, or secondary. Now, primary means that the only structure that is affected is the CNS. There's no systemic disease. And when we say CNS, we mean the brain, the meninges, the spinal cord, and, and the, the, of the orbit, the eyes. Secondly, you have systemic disease, and then the CNS is involved. So it is different, very, very important to define whether a patient has a primary or a secondary because the approach is totally different. If we look at the primary CNS lymphomas, they constitute something like 3% of all the primary CNS tumors. So we have to look carefully at this. 3% of the primary CNS tumors are made in lymphoma. That's why I'm saying that lymphoma is a forgotten disease. People are not thinking of it enough. People are not looking for it enough and it is just misdiagnosed. If we look at those primary CNS lymphomas affecting the brain, 95% are B cells, B cell lymphoma. So they're called diffuse large B cell type, diffuse large B cell type, 95%. Only 5% are others, i.e. T cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, lymphoblastic lymphoma, intraparenchymal with zone uh, lesions and so on. Why does it localize itself to the CNS? It's poorly understood mechanism, but it's, it's said that the neurotropism has something to do with it. And as I said, when we say CNS, I mean the brain or the meninges, the meninges here, the spinal cord and the, the uh, eyes, ocular uh, system. The primary CNS lymphomas are more supratentorial, 90% are supratentorial, only 10% are intratentorial. Intorial, they could be solitary, they could be multiple. Multiple in up to 40, maybe 50% of cases. So where do they like to lodge themselves in the brain? They love the cerebral hemispheres, the hemisphere itself, 38%. They have this affinity for the thalamus and the basal ganglia. They love to go into the corpus callosum. They are periventriculars. They can go to the cerebellum and the brainstem. But look here, cerebellum and the brainstem constitute the minority. The majority are supratentorial and the majority are in the cerebral hemisphere. So in the, if we come and take them one by one, leptomeningeal involvement, i.e. dura involvement, uh, this is uh, less in the primary uh, lymphoma than in the secondary. So 
uh, meningeal disease in secondary is much more. But it can affect the meninges and the parenchyma both at the same time. They can come in, in different uh, shapes. They can just cause nodular meningeal thickening or subpendular infiltration or nodules adjacent to the ventricles. So we still speak of, to them about them as leptomeningeal disease. And there's a special type called marginal zone B cell lymphoma or mole lymphoma, mucosa associated with for tissue. It's a usually a low grade. This is a special type because the other primary CNS lymphomas are high grade malignancy. While this marginal zone B cell lymphoma is a low grade. Uh, this paper from the States 2006 yeah, about yeah. these primary dural lymphomas, they look like extradural lesions. Uh, also, this paper about the marginal zone B cell lymphoma affecting the basal ganglion. Uh, as I said, it can affect the meninges or it can affect the parenchyma itself. And as I said, it, they love the, the, the hemispheres, uh, frontal uh, lobe in particular, periventricular. They look iso or might be hyperdense. There's homogeneous enhancements associated with edema. And sometimes they, they represent like ring enhancement lesions. And that would impose a very important differential diagnosis issue. So as you see, these are parenchyma lesions in the lymphoma, in the parenchyma itself. And it happens that these four cases are my cases. They can affect the corpus callosum, as you said, as I said. Here they are involving corpus callosum, so they are affecting the midline commissures. They could be intraventricular, and here you go into the differential diagnosis of intraventricular lesion. They may have subependymal spread. Look at this subependymal. They can affect the choroid plexus, like in this paper back in 2008. Choroid plexus, uh, B cell lymphoma. They can affect the pineal gland, pineal gland lymphoma. They can, as I said, affect the eyes, ocular. So, ocular involvement in patients with the primary CMS lymphoma. Uh, this patient has this primary CMS lymphoma, and he has, uh, or these patients would have diffuse vitreous obesity and uh, subretinal infiltration, intraocular lymphoma, as you can see here in this fundus, and look at this optic OCT has been involved. So they say, if you think a primary CNS lymphoma, think ocular, look into the eyes of the patient, examine him properly, because they are, the eyes are affected in something like 10-15% of cases. Orbital lymphoma can be there, it's one of the differential diagnoses, of orbital lesions. Uh, this is a primary sinus lymphoma affecting the optic nerve. This is from Japan. You can see it can be easily misdiagnosed as a pituitary tumor or hamartoma or optic nerve glioma or whatever. So again, insisting on the fact or the message, I wanted to, to be taken home that these lymphomas goes into differential diagnosis of any CNS lesion and we one should think of them in every single case, whether it is dural, parenchymal, or whatever. Can it affect the spinal cord? Yes, it's only 1% of cases, and they love this junction, cervical thoracic. They could be extradural, they could be intradural, they could be intramedullary. One case from India showing this involvement of the cord like this, like transverse bilitis or like intramedullary tumor. What about the histology? And here, when I discuss this, I'm gonna ask for the help of my colleagues. I hope they are here, uh, uh, Dr. Anab and Dr. Abu Farsakh. Uh, I will call upon them and I hope they will be there. So if you do these slides, you would see sheets of uh, large to medium sized lymphoid cells with irregular, irregular nuclei, coarse chromatin and small nuclei. But that is not enough. You need to do the whole spectrum of immunostaining. And we in Jordan here have been doing this for decades over decades. GFAP, cytokeratin, CD3, CD10, CD20, CD56, 
and we do uh, B cell markers here, as we said, B cell markers CD19, CD20, and CD79A are important for these uh, lymphomas. Leukocyte common antigen, NSE, synaptopycin, IgM, PCL2. This is a new one. We've been doing it also. And of course, the UKI67, and you can see here, this is a highly malignant tumor. Uh, so in addition to the study of this of the slides, you need to do these in immunostraining as a whole. And uh, as I said, uh, CD30 is negative, CDT is negative, SAC and D1 is negative, but not in all cases. And once you have a case, and if you are a histopathologist, then you would go into the dilemma of what is this lesion? Is this a high-grade lymphoma? You want to differentiate it from other tumors because they look the same. Is it lymphoma? Is it sarcoma? Is it a neuroepidermal tumor? Is it high-grade glioma? And if you settle to say, well, this is a lymphoma, not sarcoma, then you would go into, again, is this a diffused large cell? Is this a Burkitt lymphoma? Is this anablastic? Is this lymphoblastic or any uh, mantle cell type? So uh, there are features to differentiate between uh, the two. And uh, here, if uh, any of my colleagues are around, Dr. Annab or Dr. Farsa, please can you uh, join us? Are you there? I'm here, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. So go ahead, please. Can you tell us more about these uh, histology features? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim Sbeh. Uh, my name is Ala Adasi. I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist. Um, and I use to see these patients from uh, both sides, from the neuro-oncology side and from the lymphoma side. This is a fascinating disease. Um, as you have um, uh, discussed, most uh, CNS <laughs> are B cell lymphomas. And most of them would fall in the diffuse large B cell lymphoma category. I'm talking at the um, primary uh, type affecting the brain as opposed to secondary uh, uh, extending from elsewhere in the um, uh, in the body. Now, a diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, can happen uh, de novo as a primary sense lymphoma. It can happen as a secondary uh, involvement from other sides of the uh, body. Burkitt lymphoma is notorious to infect the CNS and therefore, Burkitt's uh, lymphoma is integral in all the CNS, uh, all, all the Burkitt lymphoma treatment algorithms. Um, and a plastic large cell lymphoma uh, can uh, definitely uh, affect the, uh, the CNS. Uh, lymphoblastic lymphoma, or ALL, uh, again is notorious to affect the CNS and in the treatment algorithm of those um, lymphomas, leukemias, CNS prophylaxis is integral in this. Now, mass lymphoma rarely involves the, the CNS either uh, de novo or secondarily. Um, uh, for primary CNS lymphoma, that is CNS lymphoma that is not a uh, second involvement of other lymphoma in the, uh, in the body, secondary lymphoma or primary lymphoblastic lymphoma or primary matter lymphoma. Most of them tend to be B cells and most of them would fall close to what we would Consider as diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Though in the most recent WHO classification, as Dr. Hussam, of course, would uh, would rectify right now, uh, uh, CNS lymphoma is a category on its own, regardless of the uh, the actual subtypes. Now, it's important, as uh, Dr. Brahim has already mentioned. To take it into consideration in the differential diagnosis of all the aforementioned lesions in the differential diagnosis, because the treatment is radically different as we are going to get back to uh, down the road in, 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 in this uh, meeting. And it's important not to give these patients with CNS lesions steroids, as is the habit in uh, ER physicians, because you will basically melt down the lesion and it will be extremely difficult later on to ascertain with uh, certainty uh, the actual subtype that we're dealing with. 
uh, it's very important whenever you're contemplating the possibility of CNS lymphoma, either primary or secondary, to try to avoid giving steroids. And if you're really worried about a mass effect, you can uh, use uh, osmotic diuretics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, no, we will, will allude to this also later on during the presentation. Any one of the, uh, of course, that was Dr. Alain. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Rahim. I'm Dr. Hussam Abu Farsakh. I'm an American board certified pathologist. Uh, I work with Dr. Brahim over uh, a decade uh, on the uh, different neuropathologies. And the lymphomas in particular, uh, uh, it's not enough just to call it uh, uh, lymphoma. You have to really subtype it because the oncologist treatment depends very much on the uh, actual uh, name that you will give for subtype of the lymphoma. Uh, if it is uh, large cell lymphoma, we have to exclude, we have to prove that it is large B cell lymphoma or anaplastic lymphoma in that we have to do ALK protein and TD30, or we have to do uh, to exclude not, not to be granulocytic sarcoma, which is a part of leukemia that can happen in the brain. Uh, all these things, uh, the morphology can actually mimic each other uh, very much in lymphomas, uh, and the only way to tell them apart beside morphology is to do uh, an extensive panel of immunohistochemistry. That's why in lymphoma, we usually are very generous in doing uh, immunohistochemistry. We do about uh, 15 to 20 immune staining to really subtype the lymphoma to the exact type so the patient can, uh, uh, can get the proper treatment. Uh, as uh, Dr. Adasi alluded that uh, this can be primary CNS lymphoma or can be part of the systemic disease lymphoma. It's very important to really with your immune staining to, to verify uh, this uh, uh, feature, whether it's primary or secondary, along with the clinical presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Farshak. So the first one was Dr. Ala Adasi, a medical oncologist, and our friend Dr. Abu Farshak is the uh, histopathologist and American boarded. Is Dr. Hassan Annab around? Yes, I'm here. Would you please give us a few uh, uh, ideas about the histopathology of these lymphomas and your experience with them? Well, I don't think I, I can add much to what has been said. Uh, <clears throat> we are lucky nowadays that we have this panel of immune markers that would enable us to subclassify all types of lymphoma with ease, actually, if you, if you perform all this large panel of immune markers. Uh, I have to say that the most common type of uh, lymphomas that we encounter in the brain is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is my experience. And uh, now in the orbit, actually, I have seen quite a few examples of marginal zone lymphoma, which is probably more common than uh, this is my experience, but it could, it could be that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is also uh, a common presentation in the orbit. Uh, otherwise, I don't have much to add. This is a standard procedure now that we perform immune histochemical markers on all lymphomas in the brain and everywhere else. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. If I may comment upon the point mentioned by uh, our dear colleague, Dr. Annab, definitely orbital lymphomas, the most common orbital lymphoma one would see uh, would be uh, marginal zone lymphoma. There's no question about it. For the sake of uh, the audience that are not, uh, that may not be accustomed to dealing with lymphomas in this region, I have to emphasize that orbital lymphomas per se have absolutely nothing to do with ocular lymphoma, uh, either primarily or as part of uh, CNS lymphoma. Orbit is a different compartment with a whole different uh, approach to treatment. And I totally agree, the most common orbital lymphoma one would see would be marginal lymphoma. We do see diffuse obesity lymphoma in that part. Though, uh, uh, in addition, orbital lymphoma per se does not necessarily, if it does not involve any paranasal sinuses uh, around it, does not necessarily warrant even CNS prophylaxis. Uh, unless it's Burkitt, which is very rare in that region, or diffuse obesity lymphoma with high enough risk features to warrant CNS prophylaxis. It's, it's extraordinary to see the difference in behavior between the orbit and the ocular, which is part of the CNS, as everybody in this audience knows. Thank you, Thank you Allah, very much indeed. We will proceed now and uh, we'll uh, speak something about the presentation. 
the HIV related is different from the HIV not related. In young patients, the HIV related is young group, while the competent patients are 60 and above. Uh, um, so the immunocompetent is older than the uh, immunodeficient. And the males to females is 1.5 to 1, just the majority of males, uh, unfortunately for us. Uh, now, this is the presentation here is different from the usual informal. These points here that I want to mention are that this, uh, John, there is some interference with the, the noise. John? John? Okay. Patients do not present like, like a usual lymphomas with fever, weight loss, or not. So don't expect to see that. You may see it, but don't expect to see it in every patient. Uh, seizures in these cases, although they are spacey to buying lesions, seizures are less common than other tumors. They can present like a hemorrhagic stroke. I've been talking recently to our senior uh, neurologist, Dr. Muriz Dahdale, and he told me that he sees many of these cases of lymphomas presenting like hemorrhagic stroke. So be aware of that. Uh, this is a paper uh, from uh, Qatar and USA. Uh, paper also uh, in the uh, world of the neurosurgery, a growing intracerebral hemorrhage. So see the uh, increase in the amount of hemorrhage inside the lymphoma. And this is important because we see lots of intracerebral hemorrhages and we do not think of hemorrhage into a tumor. So hemorrhage into a tumor is, should be and must be thought of as one of the causes of hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is not only due to hypertension or aneurysms or IVMs or dura fistula. It can be also due to coagulopathy. It could be due to aspirin. It could be to medications. And it could be part and parcel of hemorrhage into a tumor. And by the way, the commonest tumors they have hemorrhage into are gliomas followed by meningiomas. Uh, this also paper uh, presenting as acute massive intracerebral hemorrhage uh, from South Korea. Again, intraneural hemorrhage from Japan, published in World Neurosurgery. So hemorrhage is, is, is a feature of these tumors, though it is not that common, something like maybe 2 to 3% of cases of primary CNS lymphoma can present like a bleed. Let's look at the imaging. How do they look on images? Uh, MRI or CT scan, often a ring enhancing. And we said 10 to 20%, you have to remember this. And you have to do spinal MRI if you just cannot do LP and this part to make sure that you don't have any spinal lesions. So this is the usual features of the MRI in various sequences. And in the diffusion, there is the restriction because these are highly malignant tumors and they will have some restriction or major restriction. Various features, various sequences of uh, lymphoma on MRI. Uh, that's how they look on the flare. They have good uh, take of the contrast. Uh, so they enhance homogeneously with the contrast enhancement. But look at the shape. They have this funny shape, bizarre. I developed this, this um, idea about them. When the shape is bizarre, think of lymphoma. I just developed this uh, notion. Significant edema can be associated with them. So edema is not only the abscess and the glioma and the meningioma. They could be also part of uh, lymphomas. They can have a satellite lesion like this, make you suspicious. Uh, sometimes they have this incomplete ring enhancement and that brings to you the differential diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Uh, as I said, on diffusion, the there is definite restriction. These are highly malignant tumors. They could be multifocal. And again, here they, you will go into differential diagnosis of multifocal lesions. We'll come to that. But it's uncommon to see necrosis or calcification in them. And then you may see something like lymphomatosis. It's everywhere in the, in the brain, in the meninges, in the ventricles. And there's a special type of this lymphoma, the intravascular angiocentric lymphoma, and they grow inside the blood vessels like this. Uh, this is from the book of Anne Osborne. Uh, this is a new paper, 2018, uh, new radiological features of lymphomatosis cerebri. So you can see it's everywhere in the CNS. 
Uh, this new paper, 2017, about the new MRR perfusion features. And again, you can see the regions and how they look in various sequences and on diffusion. Another case. So a new insight into how you can differentiate these lesions from the others. As we said, the first point is, is this a lymphoma? You have to differentiate it from other lesions. And once you define that this is lymphoma, then there's another line that you should go into. Again, new uh, uh, insight into these uh, MRIs of these uh, lesions. Is there any value for PET scan? The answer is yes, especially when you have a tumor recurrence. And do we have recurrence in lymphomas? Yes, the recurrence is high with the treatment of primary CNS lymphoma. So uh, the PET scan would help you uh, recognizing uh, the tumor recurrence. Other cases of tumor recurrence diagnosed by PET scan. So PET scan is a useful tool in our armamentarium against these uh, uh, malignant lesions. So here we have to really stop and think, pause and think. What's the differential diagnosis of these lesions? One would say, oh, it's, oh it's, it's look like a funny lesion and it's everywhere, so it has to be lymphoma. You'll change your mind in after a few slides. A glioma, multicentric glioma, look at this. It looks like a lymphoma. This is one case of mine, 60 year old male patient with this funny multicentric lesions. Could it be multiple lymphoma or multicentric glioma? Liponeurocytoma, I had two cases in my career and they look funny and they were not lymphomas, they were liponeurocytoma. Germinoma, patient of mine from Iraq, 15 year old, look at this. Germinoma. Subepidemic giant astrocytoma, and we published our series uh, about this Jordanian family with this subepidemic giant astrocytoma because this is a favorite site, site for the lymphomas. This was not a lymphoma, this was a sub giant cell astrocytoma in three siblings in one Jordanian family. Cavernomas, they can be multiple, and usually they have this Hispanic uh, uh, predilection. They come more in Hispanic uh, genders. A small uh, blood vessel disease, the cerebrovascular disease, they can present like a lymphoma. So lymphoma can present like a stroke or like a bleed and also can uh, be uh, misdiagnosed with a small vessel disease. It's a dilemma in diagnosis. Infarct and ischemia, just the same. Metastasis, multiple metastasis. You would think of multiplicity, lymphoma should be in the cards. Sister sarcosis. Toxoplasmosis, and toxoplasmosis is common in the IDS patients. Uh, and, and the lymphoma is the commonest tumor there. The brain abscesses, especially in ocardia, especially in, in patients with heart disease, they present with these multiple brain abscesses, tuberculosis, and in the Middle East, it's very common in Yemen, and in Turkey, and in other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, sarcoidosis, multiple lesions, like tuberculosis, acute demyelinating encephalopathy, Jacob Fitzgerald disease, Langerhans histocytosis, multiple lesions. People don't think of Langerhans except affecting the skull. It can affect everywhere. Supracellular, it can affect the parenchyma, supratentorial and infratentorial. Encephalitis in all its uh, spectrum, uh, whether it is HIV positive or otherwise. Leukoencephalopathy, which I mentioned. Multiple sclerosis, and we have seen case of uh, cases of lymphoma presenting with incomplete ring enhancement like this uh, in, in, multiple in multiple sclerosis, especially the so-called uh, tumefactive type of multiple sclerosis. They look like tumors. And this is very, very important paper. Again, a recent publication from 16 about uh, uh, demyelination preceding uh, the diagnosis of lymphoma. So if you diagnose a patient as having a demyelinating disease, and then you discover that this is not a demyelinating disease, this was a lymphoma. And this is such a case, uh, these lesions were uh, diagnosed as uh, MS, and they were followed, they increased in size, 
increased volume size, we have had to take them out and they turn out to be uh, an improvement. And uh, they put this criteria to differentiate between demyelinating and the, uh, the um, lymphomas. Uh, so one can really uh, differentiate and both can actually have some response to the steroids, as you know. Vasculitis in all its spectrum, scleroderma, Bejit disease, systemic lobus erythematosus, and so on. Look at these lesions. They look like uh, lesions that we have seen in, in the problems. Again, this paper about a case that had been diagnosed as vasculitis and then turned out to be a lymphoma. So lymphoma should be in the differential diagnosis of any intracranial lesions. We have to think of it every time we see a case. So how would you... Professor Speh, yeah, please just please, interject please. here. Yeah. Uh, may I just echo what you have uh, uh, just graciously said? Uh, these are actual cases, and the message for the audience is the importance of always thinking of this rare entity, prominent lymphoma, uh, at the back of one's mind whenever one is encountering any of these lesions. Uh, it's important to emphasize that lesions like what looks like MS, what looks like demyelination, what looks like vasculitis, what looks like sarcoid, uh, entities that would classically be uh, treated with uh, uh, steroids at least as part of the regimen with radical improvement. If we do not have actual pathological diagnosis of these entities, these patients with prominent lymphoma would be simply missed and they would be doomed to a course of recurrence that we know never know the etiology of, particularly that the masquerading uh, disorders like vasculitides, like demonating disorders, like MS, etc., etc., are actually known to recur and to actually ultimately cause the demise of patients when not treated. It's very important to always take into account at the back of one's mind, the possibility of such a rare diagnosis, even when it presents in unclassical uh, modes of presentation. Thank you. That was Dr. Adasi, a medical oncologist. Am I Jordan? Uh, we'll proceed. Uh, the diagnosis and the staging of these cases. So, uh, the stages that we do, we do all kinds of uh, uh, investigations and uh, trying to reach to diagnosis, biopsies, CSF studies, ophthalmological examinations, images, bone marrow, and so on. We want to stage these diseases. And now start with the physical examination. And uh, Dr. Ala Adasi would always mention that people are shy now to examine the testes or to examine the genitalia of patients because this is not important nowadays with the imaging, uh, new imaging that we have. It's nonsense. We have to go into details. We have to look into the nails and some angular areas and into the genitalia and so on and so forth. And examination of testes is a very important part of the examination in cases of lymphomas. Uh, don't, uh, don't forget the ophthalmological part. If you think primary CNS lymphoma, think ocular. So images include brain and ear sinuses, the spine, chest CT, abdomen CT, PET scan, ultrasound of testes, and the whole spine to make sure that you don't have spinal lesions or drug metastasis, or something else that would make you change your diagnosis. Chest and abdomen and pelvis CT, uh, complete CBC, KFT, liver function test, viral serology, and you may need to do bone marrow, and you, as we said, you need to do tumor markers, and in case of HIV related, you have to do HIV and hepatitis screen. Tumor markers would include CA, beta HCG, CA199, PSA, CA15.3, CA125, alpha fetoprotein, uh, and PPTA. Uh, human coronary gonadotrophins, and so on and so forth. CSF analysis is of uh, paramount importance, the routine CSF analysis, and the gram stain, the anti-toxoplasma, the uh, acid fast bacilli, uh, the viruses, the oligoclonal banding. Uh, picture of a CSF cytology, where one see lymphocytes uh, in the CSF. So you may need to do the biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. 
uh, including vitrotamine, vit vitrotamine vitamin uh, biopsy. So you have to establish the diagnosis before you start your treatment. And that, coupled with the differential diagnosis that we add, this is an art of medicine. This is an art of a group of people joining forces together to give the patient the best result possible. It is not a neurosurgical problem. It is not a neurological problem. It's not an oncology problem or a radiology problem. It is a problem of all of us to make a team who can look into depth into these uh, patients and give them the best treatment. So the first question is, this is an lymphoma? And we, we discuss the uh, differential diagnosis. And once we go to that, then what is the treatment? So is this a lymphoma? We confirm the diagnosis. Is this a primary or secondary lymphoma? And if a primary, what should we do? As I said, I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell into the secondary lymphomas. The topic for tonight is a primary CNS lymphoma. Let it spill it from the very beginning. Chemotherapy is the main line of treatment. Radiation has very little to do, and surgery has very little to do. Chemotherapy is the treatment. Let me discuss. So standard of care is chemotherapy, with or without intrathecal chemotherapy, with or without radiotherapy as a whole brain radiation. Uh, the the uh, chemotherapy here is uh, combined modality therapy, uh, radiation with chemo, and look at the two-year survival rate is 43 to 73, overall survival is 37 months. We're still dealing with the malignancy, high, high degree malignancy. Methotrexate is the main thing, I mean, uh, this is uh, the main uh, chemotherapeutic agent, and you need those uh, uh, chemotherapy agents that can cross the blood-brain barrier and can give you the best result. Ala, if you are there, can you enlighten us of uh, what is the best chemotherapy uh, for these lymphomas? Ala? Thank you, Professor Sbeh. Um, the single most important agent in the treatment of CNS lymphoma, uh, primary CNS lymphoma, is methotrexate. And the important thing is delivering methotrexate at enough doses uh, systematically that we are comfortable uh, of it penetrating the blood-brain barrier and the mainstay of this would be methotrexate in excess of three grams per meter square. Now it had been studied up to the dose of eight grams per meter squared in primary sinus lymphoma and the idea is the more methotrexate you give the better Methotrexate less than three grams per meter squared as single agent is probably not going to be equally efficacious. Um, other agents, apart from the agents mentioned on the slide that have really importance in this field, would be uh, cytarabine and uh, thiotapa, uh, uh, either uh, sequential with methotrexate or in combination with methotrexate as in uh, uh, the case of the matrix regimen, for example. Uh, rituximab, which traditionally is not thought of as an agent that would penetrate the blood-brain barrier, has been shown to actually add to the efficacy of these agents when uh, 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 used in combination with uh, uh, methotrexate or methotrexate arasi, uh, et cetera. Now, the, the, uh, the regimens used for the treatment of this uh, rare lymphoma uh, are complex. Now, to summarize a very difficult area of the medical literature, uh, oncological literature, uh, suffice it to say the following. One, the cornerstone is high dose methotrexate. Two, you always try to delay radiotherapy or avoid it altogether as much as possible because primary cell lymphoma is particularly susceptible to developing neurocognitive disorders long term and you are thinking of the sequelae of radiotherapy long term much more than what you would expect from radiating the brain with other primary uh, brain tumors uh, uh, like uh, uh, gliomas be they high grade or low grade gliomas for for low grade gliomas when we radiate the brain and we follow them up for years we really don't see the same amount of neurocognitive impairment that patients with primary cyst lymphoma uh, develop either because they received radiotherapy first line 
or because they received radiotherapy following a methotrexate-based regimen. And the neurocognitive uh, uh, um, uh, impairment they would get and the encephalomalacia that they would get down the road is actually much worse than the disease. You Patients might be cured of the primary sense lymphoma and they would end up being incontinent, ataxic, and demented. Uh, they Alaa, actually Alaa, would be much study? better Alaa, off Alaa, dead of the disease. Alaa, can you hear me? I'm sorry? Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you uh, unmute your can you uh, me? video? Because we don't see you. If you just unmute your video, then we can see you. We hear you, but we don't see you. Yeah, we're not seeing so is, this is, uh, you can't see me? No. no we're not. We can well, you're it. not losing much. Imagine uh, <laughs> a black beard, glasses, black beret. That would be me. But it's just, you know, just need to click on the, on the screen that we can see. Uh, let me see. Uh, stop video, start video. Uh, uh, can you see me now? Not yet. No. Uh, can you see me now? No. Uh, can you see me now? No. Okay, imagine a Che Guevara like figure with a beret glasses and a beard. <laughs> you, All in black. We will see you at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation and bring you in. Uh, so you want to add anything more on the chemotherapy? So we, we, yes. So the 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 goal. Uh, so methotrexate. We try to delay radiotherapy as much as possible. Sure. Uh, uh, we resort to radiotherapy when we when we give it. It is important to remember that giving methotrexate after radiotherapy carries uh, a huge toxicity. For patients who failed methotrexate. Uh, and their relapse, we can repeat methotrexate again. Uh, for those who failed methotrexate and radiotherapy, we can use agents like uh, uh, high-dose uh, cytarabine, thiotapa. We can uh, resort to um, uh, autologous bone marrow transplantation. We can use timozolomide and the like uh, uh, down the road. The best chance for treatment is the first time around. Uh, using methotrexate at high enough doses for enough period of time. One famous protocol, the NSI protocol, would give eight grams per meter squared every two weeks for up to, uh, 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 for a little bit more than a year, if they attain uh, CR in an adequate fashion. Uh, if they don't attain CR after that duration, we would radiate the foci of residual disease. If they recur after the radiotherapy and methotrexate, we can resort to things like high dose RSC. A matrix regimen that would give RSC to, uh, with thiotipa to the, to the methotrexate. The downside of this is that you decrease the dose of radiotherapy, you decrease the dose density intensity, and you limit your options after radiotherapy because you would have burned three cards before the radiotherapy, the methotrexate, the thiotapa, and the cytotherapy. I'm sorry, you're muted there. Can you unmute, Dr. Sabah? Can you hear me? Yes. Right. Uh, some of the papers about these uh, chemotherapeutic uh, treatments. Uh, this paper uh, shown this comprehensive approach to the diagnosis and treatment of a newly diagnosed primary CNS lymphomas at the diagnosis and after completion of the uh, chemotherapy. It's just a magic thing. But remember, they can recur. Uh, again, here uh, the lesions and just two months after chemotherapy. Uh, I looked into literature and found that these are some of the studies that currently are recruited in Germany, the Matrix, the Martin, PQR, and the NOA, uh, different uh, uh, regimen of the treatment. Uh, what is the induction therapy and uh, various kinds of uh, protocols for chemotherapy, which Dr. Ala Adasi alluded to in an elegant way. What about, what about radiotherapy? Yes? Well, there's a question in the chat from Kula Asmat uh, that says, uh, let me see here, hold on, let me get the question. Can we, can we leave the question till the end? Uh, yeah, sure, 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 of course. Uh, radiotherapy, uh, as we have just mentioned, and all of us has mentioned, they have a very little role in the treatment of these uh, lymphomas. 
again standard of care is chemotherapy with or without intrathecal chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy so it has limited uh, line of uh, management here in these lymphomas again if our friend dr samuel khatib a radiation oncologist around can you step uh, up and uh, tell us a few about the radiotherapy or these uh, cases sammy are you around no he's not so i will proceed maybe at the end of the presentation what about sammy if Sammy is not around, may I, may I interject here to the importance of radiotherapy? Sure. Um, radiotherapy really works, uh, uh, um, not as a single agent, though. As a single agent, you're talking about a median survival of around six months, even less than that, for something that can be controlled for a much longer period of time with the aforementioned regimens. Now, even in a palliative setting, uh, radiotherapy alone uh, would not really do the trick. And most of the latter neurocognitive uh, side effects are because of radiotherapy, particularly in the milieu of a previous methotrexate. So I have to emphasize that radiotherapy really works. We try to do craniospinal radiotherapy as much as possible. If the uh, uh, ocular compartment is, uh, uh, is involved, and did not attain CR after high dose methotrexate, that's encompassed in the radiotherapy uh, field as well. Um, uh, it's an excellent salvage regimen. And the, the, when methotrexate was given in a, in a high enough dose for enough period of time, there is data to show that delaying radiotherapy uh, and uh, reserving it as a salvage option later on does not compromise the overall survival of these patients at all. So when we delay the radiotherapy, we can use it later on as salvage without compromising the overall survival of these patients. So the message to take home, Allah, is that radiotherapy should be delayed. It is not an above-front treatment. Delay it as much as possible, give chemotherapy, and then there may be a place, a good place for radiotherapy. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, I agree with Dr. Ala. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm Sami Khatib. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Ala because most of the cases uh, could be resolved only with chemotherapy and no need to use radiotherapy. Unless uh, later we could use it as a salvage uh, protocol. Yeah. Thank you, Sami. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, surgery. And uh, again, here, as I said, surgery has very little uh, role to do. Uh, Let's, let's agree about this. Gross total resection is typically not possible. This is an infiltrative malignancy and it has multifocality. So no one can speak about gross total resection. Uh, so you don't need to do surgery unless you want to confirm the diagnosis. So surgery here is not as a palliative. It is not as a curative. It is used for diagnosis, whether just a stereotactic biopsy or a partial excision through a craniotomy. Uh, Look at this paper from New York, 2018, Craniotomy and Survival for a Primary Central Nervous System Lymphoma. The conclusion here, craniotomy is associated with increased survival over biopsy. So if you want to do surgery, and that is in case of large tumors, and there's a space occupying uh, effect of the tumor, and uh, uh, then it's better to go for craniotomy rather than biopsy. It gives you this edge. So in conclusion, they said it might provide, it may provide a therapeutic effects, but again, there is no more complications than any other craniotomy for another, any other tumor. And they showed the extent of the resection. This is a seal study showing the extent of the extension, uh, gross total versus subtotal versus biopsy. And obviously the uh, gross total has the upper edge. Again, this paper about the role of surgery for resection, not for just biopsy, for resection, which I believe in. Uh, they also show that there is a value of surgery for site reduction. That is, if you don't have a diagnosis or if the patient is going off, if he's rapidly deteriorating and there is a mass effect, then you would go for surgery uh, as such. So surgery for lymphoma for site reduction. And uh, they have published this paper about the progression-free survival. It increased in gross total resection than in biopsy. The complete line here is the complete resection. Yeah. So it, has, it has this edge on others. Uh, the overall survival improved in gross total. 
again here it improved uh, can somebody please uh, switch off his microphone because we are hearing so yeah. many voices yeah, so okay. Okay. can you unmute yourselves uh, and this is the recent publications uh, we are talking about uh, two, uh, 2012 2015 and so on and they say there is a positive additive effect of surgery uh, uh, they are supporting the subtotal or gross total resection. Uh, again, this is, should be taken from case to case. You have to uh, weigh the advantages versus disadvantages and to make the correct uh, choice. Uh, again, this paper from Germany, 2017, uh, about the surgical removal of these tumors. Safety of resection for a primary central nervous system. Uh, we, uh, we just discussed that. So, Let's come to the steroids, which Dr. Alain Tassi alluded to. Remember that it is not good news that steroids will actually mill the, 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 the lesion, because if you mill the lesion, then you will not get any advantage of doing biopsy. So if you are suspecting a CNS lymphoma, avoid the steroids. This is very important. Somebody may jump and say, OK, if the patient is deteriorating, what should I do? Use other um, measures like Manitoul, like Lasix, whatever. Or if the patient is really going up, then you have no other choice if they are, then to give steroids and give it. But avoid it as much as possible because it, it does interfere with the diagnosis. So look at this. If you give steroids, neuroimaging regression will be there in 40% of cases. How is that? Because it will cause lymphocytolysis, it will decrease the edema, so you are happy. But you have actually masked the lesion and we've lost the chance to know the exact diagnosis. So it should not be given before biopsy. Biopsy becomes non-diagnostic because of cell lysis. We cannot, we cannot uh, you know, confirm or support this view more than this, me and Nella. So uh, steroids use increase the risk of non-diagnostic pain histology for weeks or months, not only for days, for weeks or months. Uh, this uh, paper was a very nice paper in the British Journal of Neurosurgery, and I am uh, a British trained uh, man from London. This, this paper in the year 2000, looking at if the patient is taking steroids and if the patient is not taking steroids when he comes to you. If he's taking steroids, stop steroids. Wait five days and rescan. There is sufficient target in biopsy. If he's not taking steroids, then you go for biopsy. So it's important. Don't jump for biopsy when you can uh, delay the doing this for a few days or a few weeks time. Uh, can they relapse? Yes, they can relapse. In spite of everything you do, they can relapse. And the, uh, the, the chances of relapse is something like 40%. So uh, this is the lesion here, and this is the uh, treatment, different uh, cases, of course. That's the lesion, that's the response, and then the relapse. The lesion, the response, and the relapse almost in one year time. Uh, this paper also um, from Germany, 2018, about the, the algorithm of treating these cases, the staging, the toxicity analysis, the prognosis, and making the treatment decision. We have alluded to all these points together. Uh, a new thing coming up also, the, from the primary CNS lymphoma, is to use chemotherapy autologous stem cell transplantation in poor prognostic start patients. This is just a palliative treatment. What about the prognostic factors? Are there patients who are worse doing than the others? The answer is yes. High risk in immunodeficient, high risk in post-transplant, high risk in autoimmune disease. And also uh, this paper published by the International Extranodal Lymphoma Study Group about the prognostic markers Bad prognostic markers are old age then over, over 60 is bad prognosis, uh, low KPS, Karnowski performance scale, elevated serum LDH level, high CSF protein, positive HIV serology, and lymphomatous meningitis are all bad prognostic markers. Uh, again, this paper stress the fact that CNS lymphoma in the elderly is a challenge. Are there any good prognostic factors? If they respond to steroids in the right time uh, for treatment, then yes. And the BCL6 is said to uh, be one of the prognostic, good prognostic factors. 
Uh, my personal series uh, between the 1990 and 2020 is 23 patients. And this is a big number actually for a primary CMS lymphoma for a single neurosurgeon, not for an institute, but for a single person. And males in my series are more than females, 13 to 10. I'll show you some of their images. Uh, this 68-year-old uh, female patient, look at these lesions here. And this 45-year-old uh, female patient also look at these lesions. And they deserve the differential diagnosis that we uh, put to you. 57-year-old uh, female patient with this lesion. You can see there's another lesion there, multiple. Uh, and this lady, 67 uh, female patient with these uh, lesions here. Again, they, as I said, they love the corpusculosum and the periventricular areas. This 52-year-old male patient with this lesion, which is just compressing the fourth ventricle. And this is the perfusion showing a uh, restriction. Uh, this patient, I think, came from Yemen with this uh, lesion, with this edema, and so on. So the images here are fascinating and you should think of all the spectrum of pathology there. So people are used to just think of one or two pathologies and this is reflected on the reports of the pathologist, of the radiologist or the neuroradiologist, just giving you one or two options to diagnose. We should mention the uh, very, at least the 10 suspected lesions that can come in that area. Uh, now we'll show you some cases with videos uh, this 55-year-old uh, uh, male patient with this frontal tumor, as I said, they love the parenchymal uh, brain, they love the frontal uh, lobe, and this is uh, post-op, but this is without a video. Uh, this lady will show you the video. This is a 71-year-old female patient who came from the Gulf area with this lesion associated with extensive edema. Uh, this is pre-op, and uh, this is the video. Again, and the idea of showing the video, it's a straightforward surgery, is just to show you what kind of tissues that one gets uh, from these uh, tumors. Uh, they just look like any glioma, like any uh, intraparenchymal lesion. So you can see the edema causing uh, bulging of the uh, gyri and just move within this lesion. So you come to the region and you can see this is a gelatinous kind of lesion. With no good uh, plane of cleavage, but you can you can actually feel the difference between the normal uh, tissues and the normal brain. Uh, Sucker sometimes doesn't apply, so you use the ultrasonic aspirator, and this is the cavity. Okay, so this is the kind of material that we sent for the uh, the pathologist to look at. Uh, this is the post-op, and she's she did well. Uh, of course, she was also treated with. Uh, chemotherapy. Again, this patient, a 37-year-old uh, male physician, actually, he's a surgeon. Uh, he had difficulty using or holding the, the uh, cell phone in his, uh, in his uh, left hand or hand, and he usually uh, uh, dropped it when he came to us with this uh, kind of lesion. Uh, as you can see, again, associated with a lot of edema. We've done all the tests for him. There is no systemic disease, there's no lymphoma in his body, there's no need, you know, not, nothing to think of except to go for biopsy. And as I said, I believe in going for excision biopsy rather than just biopsy. So we'll show you the uh, video. Again, the idea. the idea here is just to show you the kind of tissues that we get. You can actually differentiate the brain from you can see it's, it's gelatinous, it's, it's not a normal brain tissue. So you go and excise it and try to stay in whatever plane of cleavage you can find. And here you would uh, depend on how you feel your sucker. A sucker is, has a feeling for the normal brain on for the abnormal brain. So here we are. Can actually hold it and try to go around it. Remember, you are in a very important area of the brain. Of course, here we use the navigation to make sure that we are over. Right. This is the cavity and so on. Okay. 
this is the post-operative, and you can see post-operative, of course, followed by chemotherapy. It is saved from treatment to chemotherapy. Now, that's something like now three years, and he's doing extremely well. And this is his picture of immediate post-op, and just like a couple of days ago. Uh, this uh, girl came to us from Kurdistan, Iraq, with this uh, multiple lesions that you can see here in the fourth ventricle. And the club in the inside the ventricle, the formula of Monroe, so the cellular, etc. Again, we have done everything under the sun, we could not face the diagnosis, so we had to go for uh, surgery. And here, the surgery is to get an uh, excisional biopsy of one of the uh, main lesions, and I choose, did choose to go for the lesion around the uh, fourth ventricle. You can see here we are looking at the fourth ventricle, and this is the region which is within the inferior vernus. Again, you can feel it, you can differentiate by feeling that it's different from the other uh, normal brain tissue. Last, this is post-operative. As you can see that we've been here, we've removed this lesion in, in her brain and it was a primary lymphoma. She did up, up, uh, up to have her chemotherapy back in Iraq. Uh, and this girl also came, uh, I think from Syria. Yes, and she came with this and so in particular lesion. Look at this. Now you go into a huge differential diagnosis of a neurocytoma, of a subependymogenitisocytoma, or germinoma, all kind of tumors come across your mind when you see such a lesion. It's a huge, it's causing some obstruction, and she has a squint here, signal palsy. So we had to operate, and the operation is for a uh, radical, not, not radical, gross total section of the lesion. Uh, so this is intraventricular tumor. And here we are opening the dura and the middle frontal gyrus, and then going in into the ventricle. Using the ultrasonic aspirator. So here we are and now inside the ventricle and you can see the formula model there and you can see the thermostrate vein. Uh, preserving these structures are important, especially the thermostrate vein. And then we go more anterior, just adjacent to the caudate nucleus. And again, you can differentiate uh, the uh, caudate from the tumor. As you are there, you are trying to exercise as much as you can without uh, sacrificing the neurological status of the patient. But doing gross total section would help the uh, future chemotherapy. So here you are, you can see the inside of the ventricle in front of the model is open, and we have done gross total section. So this is the immediate post-op, and we do immediate, when I say immediate, this means the following morning. So just a few hours, 10 hours maybe, or 15 hours after surgery. And uh, this is the long follow-up after chemotherapy. There's no lesion, and this has been there. This uh, patient has been followed up for now uh, something like seven years uh, with no recurrence. So my conclusions are, CNS lymphoma was once thought to be uh, to have a dismal uh, prognosis. It is now reasonable to anticipate long-term survival and possibly a cure for a significant fraction of CNS lymphoma in primary or secondary patients. Uh, this paper also from Harvard, USA 2011, survival among patients and this period of time between 73 and 2004 
again showing you the Kaplan Meyer curve. Uh, the Kaplan Meyer curve shows survival and overall cohort is more in the uh, 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 radical accession. Uh, again, the fact that these tumors, these patients, CNS lymphoma patients, they require a multidisciplinary team. It does not mean one person, it's a team of workers who are uh, diligent workers who know each other, who understand each other, who work together for the benefit of the patient, hematology, oncology, neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychiatry, ophthalmology, pathology, and radiation oncology. With this, I finish, and the floor is open for any comments or questions. John? I'm sorry? We finished. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Sabea. I'm sorry I was doing some administrative stuff. Okay, uh, the floor is open now for comments or questions. There's one question I'll start off with. Um, now, uh, now we can see Dr. Ala Adasi as he described himself as a Chi Jivara figure with his uh, gray. Uh, so it's good to see you, Ala. We hear your opinions. It's nice to see you with us. Also, I can see Dr. Hassan Anab, Dr. Sam Khatib, and Dr. Bafar Sakh. So all are welcome. We're open for any questions or suggestions or comments. Yeah, Ahmed al Girardi asks, in such large tumors, do you use lumbar drain? And if yes, how much CSF should be drained? We should not be putting any lumbar drain. Lumbar drain is contraindicated in this patients. They have a spatial wine lesion and they would herniate immediately when you put your needle in the lumbar thicker. So it is totally contraindicated. Okay, thank you. Okay, I call Kula Azmat asks, uh, and we should, we should first confirm it with DW images and MRS as biopsy, it can be lethal if we do it on vasculitis. Uh, well, yes, one, uh, one should not go for biopsy unless it is needed. If you can diagnose without it, go ahead, but you have to be almost certain of your diagnosis. Uh, if not, then you have to do biopsy. Sometimes you can't do the biopsy because of the location of the, of the, of the lesion, but you know, sometimes you need to take that biopsy and take the risk with it. Okay, and more comments or questions from the panel? And there is a question here I can read from uh, Nikolai. It says, how many of your patients had AIDS associated primary CNS lymphoma? The answer is just one patient out of the 23. He was a Syrian patient, uh, married, who had AIDS without telling anybody. And he presented to us with the spinal tumor that turned out to be toxoplasmosis, and he had lymphoma in his brain. Okay. Okay, more comments, questions before we. Oh, okay. Okay, very good, uh, Dr. Sabaya. Let me just get. Okay, uh, we're going to have 10 questions submitted by Dr. Sabaya that kind of touches on some main points. Uh, so let me just set it up. It's like last week, uh, it's called Kahoot. Uh, okay, let me let me get, just get back to it. Uh, I'm having trouble loading it here. Uh. May I have a question here, meanwhile? Yeah, surely. Go ahead. So, Professor Speer, do you believe that the, the the data that you have presented about the correlation between extent of resection and survival? Now, as you very well know, it's very uh, difficult to make sense of, of, su of such data because the post-operative treatment was not standardized. I mean, the only way to answer this question, as you very well know, is to prospectively randomize patients to, uh, who, uh, about whom you have the suspicion to either obtaining a biopsy or performing an optimal resection uh, if that's feasible and then standardize the post-operative treatment, certify, assigning them to the most important prognostic features, namely age and, and performance status. This trial was never done and will never be done with such a rare disease. So one can always say that there is an inherent selection bias because those who, who, 
who underwent the surgery, either they were fit enough to do the surgery and thereby they were younger and had better performance status, so you're selecting the good players, or they, they were in, or had impending herniation and the surgery was life-saving and had they not done it, they would have died. So you are exclu you, you are removing the worst group and the, be the, the, the best group from the analysis. It's hard to, to make sense of this. So I was interested to hear your perspective. I cannot agree with you more, Ala, that the final chapter of the role of uh, surgery in lymphoma has not been written yet. I've tried to present the uh, ends of the spectrum of how people look at the role of surgery in these lymphomas. Uh, some people would just dismiss it off the table completely, don't even think about it. It's associated with so much complications. So just me biopsy would do. Uh, these are the majority and some new uh, papers have been published with the limitations that you mentioned, uh, which I agree with that say, well, it may have a role. Even those who would say that they have a role, they put it with some preservation that make sure that you choose the right patient to have, which as you said, maybe this is a patient who is going off with a space of lesion, a young patient in a good favorable condition. So the final chapter of the role of a neuro of a surgery for uh, lymphoma has not been written yet, but I am with the uh, final opinion that chemotherapy is the mainstay of treatment and not surgery. Okay, very good. Okay, I think. Uh, let me, uh, hold can on. I, can I? Uh, can on. I ask a question? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your brilliant presentation. Thank you me. have presented a case uh, uh, having the multicentric location of primary CNS lymphoma, one in the supracellular area, one in the uh, uh, in the foramen of Monroe, another in the fourth ventricle. Uh, so, uh, what do you feel? Uh, all the tumors grows at the same time, or uh, one tumor arises, then it settles through the uh, uh, CSF and then go uh, then spread over the uh, over the brain? It's what both. It? it is both. It is multicentric and it is multi multiple lesions in different areas of the brain, and they have the tendency to go into subependymal spread. So, if they are near the ventricle, they will just go underneath the, the ependyma and spread to the other parts of the ventricles. But it is multiple lesions in different areas with sub uh, dissemination. Thank okay. you. Very good, Mohammed. Okay, get out your smartphones. Yes, yeah. Get out your smartphones. We need you to answer some questions, okay? Based on the presentation of Dr. Sabaya, the questions that he submitted. Uh, and you need to go to Kahoot. Dot it. Okay, it's Kahoot. It's Kahoot. Dot it, and use this pin one nine four six one two to enter on your smartphone. Okay, we're gonna wait a few minutes. Okay, wait for players to join. Okay. Did you just vote on your 
smartphone with the color. Okay, by far the moderate. What do you say, Dr. Sameh? Is that accurate? No, it is high, actually. It's not moderate, it's high. And uh, that's why these patients um, should be looked after by a very good team to give them the best chance possible. So there is a high recurrence rate, even with the proper treatment. Okay, very good. That's a good teaching point. Next question. Can't be wrong in that question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, the three of them are all bad prognostic signs, uh, age above 60, uh, high CSF protein and low KPS are all uh, bad prognostic uh, features. Uh, I think the, the, the age here is, is, has been written in the, is not the, what I meant. The age above 60 is the most important. So age is the most important one. But all of them are bad prognostic features. Okay, I guess everyone was right in that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are we correct on that? Majority paraventricular? No, uh, the hemispheres comes number one. Uh, it's about 40%. Uh, Periventricular is something like 12%, 13%, cerebellum is just 4%. So the commonest is the hemisphere. And when you come to the hemisphere, then you can put the, uh, the basal ganglia, the corpus callosum, and so on. But the uh, answer number one is the commonest cranial site, hemispheres. Okay, thank you. Okay, number four, primary. CNS lymphoma. Well, we will be right on that one. <laughs> right. Immunodeficient is much more, but I have to refer to the old uh, cases or old uh, papers published that it was more definitely in immunodeficient patients in the 80s and 90s, but the, the tide is now changing. Uh, we have increased number in the immunocompetent patients, but still immunodeficient is more. So the majority choose the right answer. Okay, very good. Next one, number five. I'm very seeing us the full incidence of hemorrhage. Okay, three three answers for less than five. Yeah. But yeah, less than 5%, I accept less than 1%, but the answer, the correct answer is less than 1%. Uh, it is not very common for them to, to bleed, but we have to remember uh, this rare presentation of a bleed in a primary lymphoma. We have to remember the incidence of hemorrhage into brain tumors. People don't think of them as a cause of hemorrhage. Only thing that they think of is hemorrhage. They think of hypertension, AVM, and aneurysm. And usually you read people's like, there is no aneurysm, no AVM on the images. This is not enough. You have to think in the whole spectrum of the hemorrhage intracranially. And one of them, uh, unfortunately, is the drug effect like uh, cocaine and heroin and so on. And these are common in, in some, uh, some countries. So uh, uh, the incidence of hemorrhage in the primary CNS lymphoma is not high, but the, uh, the question has been put to raise the alert about thinking of the causes of hemorrhage into tumors when you face an image with the bleeding. Okay, very good, good teaching point. Okay, next question. Common site in the spine. said 
cervical. Well, um, cervical, cervical thoracic are the majority, so um, no, I'll take that. But uh, the commonest three site, they love for one reason or another the junction between the cervical and thoracic spine. Remembering that spine involvement in a primary sinus lymphoma is one to two percent only. Okay, very good. Next one. Marginal zone lymphoma affects more. Correct choice, uh, it affects more the meninges, but it can affect the brain, can, it can affect intraventricular, but it's called marginal zone because it is at the edge and it affects the meninges more. And as Dr. Al-Adassi alluded to, it also can affect the orbit. Very good, thank you. Can we see you? Second answer, the blue, uh, for has chosen that, it's a B cell lymphoma. It's a large B cell lymphoma. In the majority, it's 95% of the primary sinus lymphoma are primary B cell lymphoma. Only 5% are the mixture of T cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and all the other lymphomas. Okay, very good. So primary CNS lymphoma role of surgery. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's the correct answer. It's mainly diagnostic more than anything else. And as I said, the, whether you just go for a cytotactic biopsy or for the excision biopsy, it's just the same. It is not a curative, and in very limited cases, it can be palliative. But it is mainly diagnostic. Okay, we're on a roll. Let's finish off with a, with a, good, and a good one. Commonest cranial lesion <laughs> Lymphoma is correct. It's the commonest uh, tumor in the AIDS patients. And as I alluded to before that, the surge of AIDS in the 80s and 90s, and I was actually in England uh, training in neurosurgery at that period of time. There are a surge of cases uh, that we have seen uh, uh, with the intracranial uh, manifestations of AIDS. Uh, so lymphoma, all of these toxoplasmosis, encephalitis, you name it, are uh, manifestations of AIDS for the commonest is lymphoma. Very good. We finished off fast. I was going to say we need to watch the video again. <laughs> Repeat the test. Okay, thank yeah. you, Dr. Sylvain, and thank you for the, the pathologist that came, that the input we had from the pathologist and the other members of the panel. And uh, do you have a topic for the next uh, Wednesday, Doc? Yeah, I will speak. Can I ask uh, our pathologist, Dr. Hassan, are you there? Can you un unmute yourself? Sorry? So, yeah, can, you, can, can I ask you a question? Yes. What in the sort of advice you would give young neurosurgeons of how to send the specimen to you if they have a brain tumor? What sh should they don't do? Things that they must not do. Well, the first thing is uh, what you have mentioned earlier that you should not treat, uh, give a steroid to the patient before you get an obtainer biopsy. And the second thing is, uh, well, at least this is the practice uh, in my institution is that uh, they send uh, the biopsies for frozen section, which is very good. And I do touch imprints on almost every case and touch imprints actually are very helpful uh, for the diagnosis of lymphoma and CNS tumors because uh, uh, you can see the morphology better on touch imprints than in the frozen section itself. So you can give an advice to the uh, neurosurgeon that you probably are dealing with a case of lymphoma and that will probably 
I mean that he will not proceed and do uh, total gross resection unless it is uh, feasible. So, and then we, we proceed from there, from there on uh, as usual. We ask for additional tissue for permanent sections because you know the freezing will induce some artifacts in the tissue and uh, it's better to do frozen section on formalin fixed tissue uh, for, uh, I mean, better to do pathology and formally fixed tissue, especially if you want to proceed with do immunohistochemistry. What about using the uh, diathermy or by, you know, uh, kind of any use of diathermy on the specimen? Yes, but, yes. Uh, uh, actually, uh, diathermy will uh, ruin the specimen, not just in the brain and any uh, uh, right. tissue when you have diagnostic biopsy. Uh, you, you can go and make so many mistakes when you have a diathermy effect, but it is sig uh, more significant probably in the brain because uh, of the nature of the brain tissue and especially if you are dealing with lymphoma. So should they be putting the specimen on a wet gauze or put it in a bottle with the, with the, with with a solution or they put uh, it on a slide? Actually, actually, what they do in my institution is they. They put the small uh, specimen, uh, the, the tiny pieces that they take for frozen section, they put it on a slide and put it in a container, closed container. And actually it takes only two or three minutes. Now, sometimes you get drying artifacts if it is delayed, but, uh, but otherwise uh, they use the slide itself as a touch imprint and we can stain it. And uh, that's what we do. Yeah. Probably it's not the best way to do it, the things, but this is what is done. Right. Thank you, thank you, Hassan. Uh, is Dr. Hassan Mufarsakh around? Hassan, are you there? No, he's not. Uh, Ala, would you like to give us final words of wisdom for young generation about how to deal with these uh, lymphoma patients? Thank you, Professor Spehan, for the comments for an excellent uh, meeting. Um, please always keep this rare entity at the back of your mind because missing it uh, uh, ha would have deleterious and lethal consequences for the patient. Please do not give steroids before getting the biopsy whenever this diagnosis is entertained, even if it's unlikely, unless it's life-saving. Even if it's life-saving, you can get with uh, uh, osmotic diuresis, etc. Uh, please always make sure that the uh, specimen is read by an experienced pathologist uh, because you only have one shot at this. Please try to think long-term with these patients. Um, you want to avoid steroids even on treatment because you want to know if they are attaining CR on the prescribed regimen or no. Please try to delay radiotherapy as much as possible and serve it for salvage. Um, and please remember that uncommon presentations of common tumors uh, would, would mean promises lymphoma, uh, and it can masquerade as all sorts of different disorders. It's a very uh, uh, easy thing to miss. And please remember that if the lesion disappears on steroids or on radiotherapy, this is not a good thing because this patients will relapse and will relapse with a vengeance. Thank you, Albert. Okay, John, I think uh, there are more normal questions. So we thank all the panelists and all our colleagues who participated in their opinions. And uh, next week, I'm gonna choose the, speak about uh, unusual Peter's bone lesions. That would be of interest to our pathologists, our ENT colleagues. Uh, our general surgeons, uh, our oncologists and uh, radiologists and uh, so on. Uh, so uh, Peter's bone lesions concentrating on cholesterol granuloma lesions. Very good. So, okay, thanks Doc and thanks all the panelists and we'll see you next week. Thank you, thank you all, bye-bye. Okay.